Podcast. Welcome to the world of the Western esoteric tradition. Finally, finally Thought Hermes podcast is back. Today is April the 2nd, 2018, Easter Monday, and it has been over three months now that you have not had a new episode from me, and I'm really sorry for the wait. I will give you some explanations and an outlook into the future in a moment, but first to all of you who have been listening to my podcast before, welcome back and thanks for your fidelity. To those who have come here for the first time, I also extend welcome greetings. My name is Rudolf, I am your host, and Thought Hermes is a podcast presenting to you extensive interviews with important authors and figures from the world of the Western esoteric tradition, as well as some music, news items, reviews, etc. Please, do also visit our website www.thothermes.com that is t h o t h e r m e s.com where you will be able to find all the show notes previous episodes etc etc Thoth Hermes podcast can not only be found on this website but also on Apple Podcasts Spreaker Stitcher, Android, Blueberry, and an ever-increasing number of podcast providers. So you got no excuse not to find us. This is the third edition of our Season 3, and I'm happy to welcome as our featured guest today, British author Tobias Churchin. More about that interview a bit later. But before we delve into the show, let me give you some personal feedback. And now, some feedback. It is now about time to give you a few explanations why it has taken me so long to produce this new episode for you, and also what will be the development in the next few upcoming months. No worries. This is not going to be long, but I feel I owe my listeners this. First, once again thanks to everyone who inquired about how I was doing. It is very nice to know that there are people out there who actually care and who are waiting for the next show to come. Thank you all. What actually happens is very easy. I have unexpectedly gotten the opportunity for a complete professional change, which I was really waiting for to happen at some point. But what that means is that since December and still until the end of June, I have kind of to do two jobs at a time, and that, of course, consumes time and energy. See, it's that easy, and it will be over in about three months. On top of that, I had a really bad flu a few weeks ago, which kept me in bed for about 10 days, and that created another kind of backlog, as you can probably imagine. So, what does that all mean for the future? I will try to produce my shows again now in a more regular way, but I cannot promise until the end of June how many shows I will release. I will do my best to do three or four until then, but please be patient with me. 
Also, not all of the episodes in the next three months will have news and review sections. I thought you would prefer to listen to an interview more regularly, rather than having the whole thing very thrill. I thought you would prefer to listen to an interview more regularly, rather than having the whole thing very rarely. Also, therefore, this episode only contains the interview with our featured guest, some music and one announcement after the interview which you should not miss, in order that I can get it now out. I hope this will be okay for you. Starting in July, though, I will have more time for the podcast than ever before. One of the reasons that I had wished to do such a professional change was also to be able to do more publishing, writing and producing my podcast, to be more creative again, after about 10 years where my work had become more and more administrative. So, Thoth Hermes is alive and will even be more so in the near future. I have a lot of plans to realize here and I'm looking forward to all of this. Thanks again for your support. Talking about feedback. Why don't you use the opportunity and send me your thoughts and wishes, this time especially for the future development of Thoth Hermes? I would be very happy to know about your ideas and also to realize them wherever possible. You remember how to get the feedback to me? Either you go on the website and there to the contact page, where you can use the form to send me your comment. Also on the website, which once again is thoughthermes.com, you'll find the possibility to send a free voice message to me. Click on the respective tab on the right of the screen on any page of the website. If you prefer, you can also find me on Facebook or Twitter. Just enter Thoth Hermes for your search or click on the respective icons on the web page. And then there is of course also good old email. Info at thothhermes.com is the one to reach out to me. And I'm looking forward to hearing from you all. Last time I had asked artists and musicians to get in touch and some of you did. I think I sent an answer to all of you, but I need to ask for your patience until I will have cleared my stack of things to do before I can actually do something about it. But I promise I will. Okay, now, before we go and listen to the interview with today's guest Tobias Churchin, let's listen to a piece of music. Many of you out there have been writing to me to play more of the wonderful music of Wendy Rule, who so generously lets me use her songs as intro and outro music to this show. Today, therefore, I will play for you two more pieces by Wendy Rule, and those pieces also show how versatile an artist she is. First, let us hear her song Hecate from her album The Lotus Eaters.
the skeleton claws, the sky. of memories Dragging behind me the howl of the winter song Hecate. As always, please go to the show notes on the website to find more information about the music and links to the pages where you can find more about it. In Wendy's case, please do have a special look on her new Full Moon concerts, which she streams for free on the internet at every full moon. Here comes the interview. Tobias Churton is not only a very prolific author, he is also a world authority on Gnostic spirituality and Britain's leading scholar in the field of the Western esoteric tradition. And the upcoming interview also shows that he is clearly a representative of the typically British humor. As always, this interview comes to you in two parts of about 30 minutes, with some music in the middle. In the first part of our talk, we hear a few facts about his life and how Tobias should have become a priest, but somehow Gnosticism came to prevent that. Also, we learn a bit about the differences and similarities between a British pub and a Viennese coffee house at least for a writer. Curious? Well, then stay with us and listen to Tobias Churchin. I'm very happy to welcome on Thoth Hermit Podcast today, Tobias Churchin. Tobias, welcome. It's a great honor to speak to you. It's been some time that I was looking forward to have you here to speak to you and about yourself, about your books, and today in particular about your latest book that has appeared a few weeks ago on Inner Traditions. Welcome, Tobias Churchin. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Rudolf. Thank you. Well, Tobias, usually I start those talks with my guests by asking them a bit about their personal background. Of course, many of our listeners must have read books by you, have seen them, have talked about them. But 
maybe they don't know demand to buy a shirt and behind it, at least as to the point as it's relevant for your books. So, Tobias, what made you what you are today in that world of the occult, the esoteric? What did you bring there? Well, it's all been a terrible accident. <laughs> <laughs> was never meant to happen. Um, I, I was going to be a priest in the Church of England. Really? Um, I, I went to Oxford on a, an exhibition as, as an intended ordained person. Um, so from the beginning, all, all through my early life, I, I was sensitive to uh, spiritual religious material. Mm -hmm. And um, when I went to Oxford... Um, I, I mean, I was a very questioning, uh, rationalist uh, mystic. Uh, and we had to do an essay on the Gnostics, which was meant to be a sort of routine um, essay of why the Gnostics were wrong. Yeah. <laughs> and my conclusion, uh, when I started reading about them in, in detail, uh, was that Irenaeus, the main critic, who I was supposed to accept as a, an authority, I thought he'd completely misunderstood what the Gnostics were doing. So that coincided with uh, my dear friend George. Um, uh, I, was, I, I was into mountaineering mm -hmm. uh, before I went to Oxford, and I went to an Oxford Mountaineering Society meeting. Was, somebody was talking about Alistair Crowley. I was going to But say it, this will be an interesting parallel later on in this interview. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And he, 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 I'd never heard of him in my life. And as somebody, Chris Bonington, a British climber, famous British climber, had been talking about Crowley as a hero of his, mm -hmm. not only because he was the first, led the first expedition uh, on K2 mm -hmm. in, in the Himalayas, but uh, in the in the Karakarams, but. Um, also because he was a great writer, mystic poet, and all this. Well, the combination of mountaineering and poetry was exactly music to me because I'd just come back from a climb in the Alps and had been writing poetry on the mountain, right. which, was all very, which was all very about personal transcendence and grasping the star that charts the way while hoping for eternity and quite romantic. So here was somebody I could uh, relate to, and this also altered my view of the orthodox material I was having to study as a, a theological student. So I, the word esoteric didn't really mean I, – I think if somebody said the word esoteric to me at the time, I'd have thought they were referring to esoteric Clapton. <laughs> so it was it, – it set up – um a totally new direction for me. And in amongst my studies, I began to identify personally much more with this whole idea of grade systems and the Golden Dawn system I was very interested in. I wrote a play, put, put it on at Balliol, called Ipsissimus. Okay. So I was pretty ambitious to start with, which was <laughs> partly satirical. It was partly satirical about whether human beings can transcend themselves and what would it mean for a human being to become god and all this sort of thing so i was i, I carried my skeptical and rationalist attitude into my gnostic studies just as much as i'd taken it into my more or less orthodox theological studies mm -hmm. but uh, overall i still believed that human life is enhanced and made real and more meaningful if people are can escape the ego, and um, but also escape the ego of others, which is even more important, and uh, start thinking for themselves and so on, and find some spiritual liberation through uh, the various avenues that are available to us, poetry, painting, music, and so on. There is a way out, uh, or at least partially a way out, if not of the world itself, there is a way out of the fiction of other people, the fiction of politicians, the fiction of controlling thoughts. Now, I was growing up in the beginnings, really, of television mind domination of the Western and now the Eastern world. So this issue about having a free mind was very important to me as I grew up. And the free mind is a, a continual risk in the modern world. So to me, this whole so-called esoteric thing 
isn't about escaping from the conditions of the real world. It's confronting the conditions of the real world with the consequences of its tendencies and finding uh, a way to keep the mind active and fresh and free and the heart and mind working in good order together. So that's the sort of thing that inspires me. It's a vocation. It's a vocation. I, I'm not uh, an abstract, abstracted scientist of the spiritual or something, but that's just, that is a part of it, mm -hmm. the power to analyze and so on. Essentially, I'm a communicator of experience and intellectual experience, spiritual experience and artistic experience. And that's what my books are motivated by a profound desire to wake the, keep the world from falling into unconsciousness. I find that an extremely interesting approach. Also, when you've at first said you were a critical, rationalistic mystic, I think that balance between the two is something that I say, unfortunately, in the esoteric world is very rarely said and found, probably. And at the same time, to me, it seems that that duality of both sides is needed to achieve what we are or you are trying to achieve. I mean, That's right. I don't think that transcending alone would bring along any progress for our material world and that's why that scepticism isn't that the base of hermeticism of gnosticism of all those great movements well i i think um so many esoteric cadres are in one form one state of reaction or another yeah and uh They're reacting against the modern world and the conditions of real life. And for many people to find a, simply a port, a harbor uh, that protects them partially from the real existence mm. uh, is enough. So when they find something they constellate into, they tend to wrap themselves up in it and swallow everything they're given. I found this particularly in the theosophical world where enormously contradictory viewpoints are held with great enthusiasm <laughs> and uh, people are prepared to believe practically anything that is different or strange and i suppose esotericism can become a kind of narcotic yeah so when i entered this not esoteric universe of groups and whether it was rosicrucians esoteric freemasons neo templars followers of hindu philosophies of one kind or another for me it was very strange company because my father was uh, an engineer i was brought up in a world of concrete reality yeah. even though even though we always in the family there was always a, a respect for God and the unknown and the mysterious and the unusual. And uh, we always, as a family, we were always sympathetic to unusual people who had strange ideas with a suspicion that the world, the dominating world, wasn't very interested in such people or was prepared to change its mind about things. So it was a, a very, I think I had a very balanced viewpoint. And my position is always I keep my feet on the ground and my head firmly in the stars mm. and beyond. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. But, you know, <laughs> if a wise man rules his stars, he needs us a point from which to rule them. And that's what planet Earth provides us with. And for anchor. all, for all, the, exactly, for all the problems on Earth, it, it is a point, it gives us a point of view. And you can't get anywhere in the world of thought without a point of view. And if you abandon your point of view, you become vulnerable to any stronger idea that's around you. Or, or indeed stronger egos and so forth. Yeah. So my path has been a, a, a quite a lonely one, really. I've hung out with groups of various kinds, but not for long. Yeah. May I ask you a personal question? You said you are more the solitary worker in that field because you don't stay with groups very long, which personally, I may say, I understand very well because I'm a bit of the same. But when I say that, I also mean about active esoteric occult work. Do you mean that or do you mean that just in your work as a writer and an author and a researcher? I th I'm a sort of hermit, I suppose, mm. but I, I, 
I'm not living on my own. I, you know, I live with my my family, and and I don't represent any sodality. Yeah, I'm not speaking for other people. I mean, I I've known very striking individuals from all kinds of esoteric traditions, uh, neo-Rosicrucian, theosophical, uh, hermetic, Masonic, and so on. Mm. And uh, I have great respect for the best of those traditions. And I, in fact, I celebrate them in my work. But I just think you should distinguish between the, the, the freedom that spiritual work can give you and the tendency of people to want to hide behind uh, larger numbers of people. Yes, indeed. I think unless you're prepared to, to back your ideas up on your own from time to time, I don't think your ideas are going to be very strong. Yeah. If I say, well, I agree with this because, because so-and-so has said it, or people who cite a load of authorities in their work for everything they write, they can't, you know, uh, what is it they said of Jesus? He spoke with authority and not as the scribes. To speak from authority means you've really gone through the thing yourself and you put yourself, you've tested the ideas and you and you go with it. I'm not saying that I've reached ultimate truth on any issue. I'm not. I'm constantly moving towards greater clarity. I don't know about Truth is when the key is uh, the key unlocks the door. Then you've got truth. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you're if you're if you're struggling with a problem and the door does open, you've hit on a truth. You may not have hit on all of it, but you've hit on part of it. Yeah. And you go and you go into the next room and and you deal with. You get accustomed to that kind of light and atmosphere, and then you learn about that, and then you're ready to move on to the next one. Yeah. Uh, I think most people. I, in my experience in the essay, tend to find a room they like and don't realize that it was, it's actually, uh, it's, a, it's a vestibule. It's just a waiting room. But uh, life has a habit of pushing you forward or so if you won't move forward, you kind of slight, you just go to sleep. It's a bit like being on a mountain. If you want to stay alive, you've got to keep moving, you know. Yeah, right. I mean, I'm not one of these people who's, who's, who can only be alone. I love company i love sharing ideas but i also love the freedom to leave which is why i love the british pub i love <laughs> pubs I, I you know in, i lived in sweden for a time and in sweden every people go around to people's houses and they have dinners and they talk and so, you know, and all of that I, I never liked that because you can't just get up and go when you want to. <laughs> yeah, I think I it's it. the same mystery with like with the Viennese, Viennese coffee houses where it's been said that all those big books of the early 20th century, which have been written in Vienna, have been written because the same thing. People can go there, but they are in the midst of people, but they are still alone and they can leave whenever they want. Yeah, this is this, this is the genius of a, of a good a good environment is when you've got that freedom to stay, freedom to meet people, freedom to leave, freedom to come again. Oh, that's what it's all about. It's almost an epitome of what freedom is in practical terms for people. Yeah. Um, but uh, I write alone. Obviously, I can, <laughs> I can write in a noisy room, no problem at all. I can go into a, a, a noisy pub, and unless it's getting violent or something, I can I can write quite happily in my in my in the space of my own mind. But it, it, writing is a solitary thing, and that's about as much solitary as I want, really. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. That's a, yeah. You single-handedly have just defined freedom. Freedom <laughs> um, is a Viennese coffee yeah. house. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I would like to take you on another definition. We were using the word esoteric, both of us, uh, uh, just right now. And often I'm looking for a better word to define what I mean with it, because at least as I feel it, esotericism, esoteric has been a bit abused over the last uh, 20, 30 years. And became a different meaning altogether. And then then is that word occult and the Western esoteric tradition or whatever. How would you either define esotericism or would you use rather a different word to define the combination of Gnosticism, Hermeticism, Freemasonry, etc., etc.? What's the terminology that is correct for you? It's more or less Gnostic of some sort or another. Anything is esoteric to anybody relatively. So if somebody's talking to me about 
the experimental calculus in mathematics, that's perfectly esoteric to me because it requires initiation into the mystery of the subject. And we're talking about forms of knowledge which require an, an initiation. Now, obviously, if you're talking about true esotericism, you're talking about spiritual progress. In order to grasp the beauty of an idea, you have got to go through a certain amount of experience before you realize just how beautiful that is. You know, we're never going to see the outside world in the way that a man who's been in prison for 20 years is going to see it. Yeah. So how you prepare for an experience, then it depends on the experiences you've had already. So the esotericism is not about a kind of knowledge. It's about how you've approached that knowledge. The end result of an esoteric initiation may be a perfectly plain experience to another person. Yeah. You know, may not be esoteric at all. It's all a question of how long you've been getting into it. Now, it just goes with the word mystery, and mysterion, by definition, is something that the more you go into it, the more there is to go into. And esotericism is obviously intended as a path to greater uh, knowledge of the truth of life. And that's what it's about. But I don't know about whether the word esoteric is abused. I mean, in England, people are rather cynical and they will call anything esoteric, which they don't want to get interested in. <laughs> There's no intellectual pride in the, in the middle class English, you know. They, they always like to pretend uh, that they don't entertain ideas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, I don't know whether that's different. In Austria and Germany, I know people tend to pride themselves on the seriousness of the thinking, whereas that's very different from in, in the English situation is we, we pride ourselves for how lightly we take things. Yeah. <laughs> But, you know, there is always the side of perception and the side of reality. So, <laughs> yeah, Well, who knows what reality is uh, at any given point? Um, if you want to build a bridge... Uh, you have to rely on the sense of reality of people who've gone before you and everything we do is, is the product of their mistakes. Yes. In, in engineering, that's the case. And I suppose it must be true also of spiritual experience. People have made plenty of mistakes in the past. I presume they will carry on making mistakes. And from that, we can make a better job of it. I've I write about Alistair Crowley, for example, because I think he, he had learned a lot of the mistakes. Uh, it's paradoxical that he's accused of making so many himself. But my, my view, he's the most advanced esotericist of the 20th century and is still, I think, in the 21st century, still out there ahead of the rest. And to me, he tells me what esotericism really is about. And it's, it's simply about gaining clarity of vision about our experience. And that's really what it's about. It's a progressive state of becoming less blinkered. Yes. Uh, it's not about acquiring exotic information. I presume whoever built the pyramids had a very clear head for his time. But the people who write about the building of the pyramids strike me as having very little clarity <laughs> of thinking at all. But... Yeah. Um, you know, because I don't think they could build one themselves. And if you're going to write about the pyramids, I presume you should be able to build your own, and perhaps a scale model at least, but from scratch, you know. If you want to write about pyramids, build one. And I think it's the same about if you're going to write about God or uh, angels or these sort of things meaningfully, it does help if you've had a certain uh, degree of experience about what it is you're writing about. Sure. And... And I think I think in a lot of writing in esoteric, so-called esoteric writing, is simply people's fantasies or their best beliefs or what they'd like to think. I always like to establish the history of a thing clearly. I like to establish a clean way of thinking about it, by which I mean I want to take the reader on a step, you know, a stepped journey that I've been on, mm -hmm. and uh, and get to a real result. You know, I always. When I was teaching at university, I always said, bring me, I didn't say bring me your huddled masses, I said, bring me your most difficult questions. They're the only ones I enjoy. The more difficult the question, the more I'm, I'm worth paying for. <laughs> I, li I like to undertake things that, are, that have become problematic. 
Yes. Alistair Crowley is a case in point. You know, anyone can write about the Hermes, Hermes Trismegistus. But what's there to say because he's so clear himself? You know? The Hermetic writings have the virtue of clarity. Whoever wrote them had been through a lot, I think. Yeah. It's like this famous dispute, has Shakespeare ever lived or not? Who cares? The works are here. And whatever the name of the guy was who wrote him, they are great. <laughs> yes, if he didn't exist, we'd have to invent him. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yes. Who wrote the Upanishads? Uh, who wrote the Vedas? It's always going to be somebody legendary. Crowley's interesting, of course, isn't it? Because he wrote his own classic. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Tobias, you have crossed my life several times already as a reader. I came across your books, which then, when they appeared, were exactly at the right time for me. I think very strongly, for example, The Invisibles, the book, the great book about the Rosicrucians that you, that you wrote. And then there were others, like, for example, r rather recently, the, the Occult Paris, or then the, the William Blake book, biography, etc., etc. You have taken on vast subjects, uh, important subjects for the esoteric world, and it seems always so obvious and clear and, and easy for you. What brings you to those subjects and what motivates you to write about them and how come that, they, that those books become so open-minded and uh, wide uh, in their subjects? Well, I suppose I've sort of suffered with them uh, in before before I ever wrote about them, uh, <laughs> as, as usual. So, I mean, I, I I don't want to inflict the suffering on my reader. Yeah. Um, so I, I I go through all that for you, and then when I when I'm clear, and it's become clear to me that I've reached the, the point a point of of understanding, then I, I write. So, but why did I write about Rose Cruz? And so it's because it was thrown at me. I had some involvement for quite a lot of years with. Joost Rittman of the Rittman Library in Amsterdam, the mm -hmm. Bibliotheca Philosophica Hermetica, and he wanted me to join the Lectorium Rosicrucianum, which is was the body that he was a member of, which was founded by uh, uh, Wim and Jan Lehner in uh, the 1920s and 30s mm -hmm. uh, with Henny Stockheiser. And He thought that that group had really tied up the whole uh, business of Rosicrucians, Cathars, Gnostics into one systematic doctrine, which is the doctrine of that particular body, the Lectorium Rosicrucianum. Mm -hmm. And the approach to these subjects of that group raised many questions in my mind, which I had to grapple with. And I was very, very lucky. I was very lucky indeed to, to encounter Carlos Gilly, who was a, a Spanish scholar, who uh, introduced me to the latest research that he'd done onto the origins of the Rosicrucians. I wanted to know everything about it. I was fascinated. I mean, back in the 80s, I was fascinated by the origins of the uh, Brotherhood of the Rose Cross. It, it was so amazing story to me. I, I called it the greatest story ever told. I think I still believe that this origin of the Rosicrucian movement is totally uh, engrossing. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. And you had these wonderful, wonderful characters from the late 16th and early 17th century, who's, the breadth of whose intellectual vision and their spirituality is, is so stunning to compare with people today. Yeah. They're almost a different breed of human being. Uh, not only do they show enormous personal courage and great physical fortitude, they lived in a world with no central heating and so on, where travel was extremely dangerous, very cumbersome. They were relied on people's libraries for their information. I'm thinking of people like Johann Valentin André mm -hmm. and Tobias Hess and your own Austrian Adam Hasselmeyer. Yeah. Uh, and these people, I just, they, they amazed me. And I adored them and I wanted to write and give them their proper proper respect, proper due, and bring, bring real light into the Rosicrucian mystery, which is not a mystery, as people have written about it. It's history. These people were trying to achieve a concrete uh, social development. And, of course, the moment I got into this, you immediately find there are umpteen groups around the world who are still purveying the most mythological trash about the Rosicrucians, the tragedy of which is to obscure, they obscure the real work of real minds. And the, and the great brilliance of the Rosicrucian experiment is lost in asking intelligent people to believe fairy stories about 
invisible beings coming back and forth and the Comte de Saint-Germain and uh, all this stuff which is mythological and legendary. Now, myth and legend are ways of telling spiritually meaningful events in a manner that can be absorbed as a story. But the trouble with masonry and and neo-Rosicrucianism is the the story is presented as history. Yeah. And if you dare question this, they treat you like the Vatican treated Galileo. It's a question question of fundamentalism when you take the... the, There is an esoteric fundamentalism, which is... I've just run into the Gurdjieff people. I think all these people keep very quiet in the world until you write about their subject or what they <laughs> what they think is their subject. And then suddenly you find that these so-called free spirits, you know, who've been enlightened, ha-ha, come out with an immense aggressive uh, thing. How dare you? You don't realize that our God, this avatar, this guru, who are you to question whether George Gurdjieff was or not anything? You have not been through the Gurdjieff transformation mm. you have no right and you i got a i with the rosicrucians because it's a more christian oriented thing uh, the uh, the criticism was less virulent and the, luckily there were people actually grateful for a for an historical treatment on the rosicrucian story my own view is that the, the spirit spirituality needs no nonsense around it at all spiritual experience once you uh, realize that it is the clarity of the truth. That's what we're aiming for. Yeah. Uh, you should welcome knowledge from all aspects in an open-hearted and proper way and follow Jesus, who, in the words of Hasselmeyer, gives us the, the great uh, secret, which is, seek and ye shall find. That was my father always used to say that to me all the time. He'd say, Toby, seek and you shall find. Mm-hmm. You have to go looking. If you've accepted something, simply accepted it. Uh, there's a touching childlike quality to that, but it's also very dangerous. Uh, we see it in the Far East, which have, you've had millions of people accept the pathetic thoughts of Mao Zedong <laughs> or uh, some other potentate in a, in a, a, a second-class army uniform, standing up and dictating their best thoughts, which are usually no thoughts, to masses, oh, yes, we all follow, you know, and they're all scared out of their wits. You know, you've had it in Europe, Adolf Hitler got up on a podium and people, yes, 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 he's our saviour. And uh, unfortunately, it's this whole thing about saviours is the problem. If you've identified one figure as the saviour of your soul, you know, you, you become quite hysterical when this figure is treated as, as a subject to analysis. If only these figures were subject to analysis. Yeah, you get what I'm saying. Absolutely. So, and that's probably also the danger of those, well, let's call them esoteric groups, to make it simple, that a group is much easier to be manipulated subverted. and subverted, exactly, than, than the single mind, isn't it? That's why, that's why you've got to keep keep a clear head. Keep your head above the water in this field. Now, I'm not a debunker. I'm not one of these cynical uh, materialist journalists who thinks that anybody who talks about religion and the soul is probably mad already. I don't Uh, get that impression. (laughs) No, I I think this is, again, this ability to combine different viewpoints. Yeah. Um, I wish to find the true dignity and the true integrity of spiritual thinkers and give them their due and say to the world today, look, these people are important. They show us a, a dimension of understanding which isn't remote from our needs. It's very close to our needs. Yes. Had I, I personally think that though the, the devil never rests us, if you like, um, even a lot, a lot of the tragedy of the loss of esoteric knowledge is thanks to the esotericists who misunderstand the concept of keeping a secret. It, it all gets kept secret, you know. <laughs> um, Jesus did, did give a sermon on the mount. He also spoke in depth to smaller numbers of people. You can't tell great truths from the marketplace anyway. Uh, and anyway, when it comes to spiritual truth, uh, it, uh, it, it's not something that's easily communicable in, in a conventional sense. That's true. You need a mind-to-mind. Books are very good. If the book is good, you can get involved with the mind of the writer yes. or, or the mind that the writer at least was in when he was writing. I am interested in, in real spiritual illumination. I, I, that is my aim. If I can't find it, then I don't claim to have found it. Mm-hmm. I don't say, I don't pretend. Some subjects uh, I look forward to understanding much better. I mean, at the moment, I'm doing a lot of research on 
Advaita at the Vedantist schools of India because I, I'm, I'm really fed up of the way people write about Indian philosophy as if it was kind of ring-fenced with so much respect that we can't just look at it like any other thought form. That annoys me. Uh, there's also a tendency, and again in esoteric circles, to regard anything that's a Sanskrit word as being untranslatable, and it would be a rather bad form to translate it and see what it means. But I keep finding that, in fact, the thoughts of the Vedanta schools are so similar to the Alexandrian Gnostics that both it can illuminate one another, and that's what I intend to do. I think ultimately truth must be simple, or at least experienced as something simple. There is a thing in the Western world that relates the word esoteric to complexity, to something that's difficult and complex. No, this is, this is quite wrong. The preparation of the mind for illuminated truth may involve some, some complexity, misery perhaps, and pain, like learning any art. Mm -hmm. uh, but the results must be simple. Yes, very good simple. point, very good point. Christoph Besold, who was, had a wonderful library in Salzburg, uh, said he used to write about the virtue of the simplest simplicity. <laughs> Very interesting man, Christoph Besold. I think, I think his library is the basis for the University Library of Salzburg today. Right. But he, was, he was very much involved with uh, Johann Valentin André, and I think it's thanks to him probably, a couple of other of his friends, that we the whole story of Damkar and the uh, going to the east in search of uh, Christian Rosenkreutz or CR, CR goes to the east in search of wisdom. I think that's thanks to Basil and some of his friends, uh, Samuel Hafenreff mm -hmm. and a few others. Well, that's fascinating. So there is a strong Austrian story, uh, side to yeah. the story, I've yeah. suddenly realized. Yes. Very interesting to listen to Tobias, I think. What I often like about those interviews is when we suddenly depart from the talk about the occult, esotericism, you have it, and all of this becomes suddenly part of our daily life, when we realize that daily life is influenced by esoteric thought, but also esoteric thinking takes its source in our lives and is not just some far-fetched thing. Wendy Rule is now back again, and this time, after having sung about a Greek goddess Hecate, she will present another female mythological figure to us, which is dear to us occultists. She interprets her song Inanna from her album World Between Worlds.
Wendy Rule, singing about and to Inanna, the Queen of the Sumerian Skies. And now we return to Tobias Jurgen and we'll talk about his latest book, Alistair Crowley in America, a fascinating tome like many others written by Tobias. Alistair Crowley played an important part in Tobias' life, so the book is at the center, but not the exclusive topic about Crowley here. Tobias is so knowledgeable in many fields, it is fascinating to talk to him. And he has a clear vision about the difference between TV and books, and why it is so important to hold a printed book in hands. Welcome back for part two of the interview with Tobias Churchin. Let's get to Alice Crowley. You have written three books about him already, and before that also uh, parts of books where you were co-author of several other books. The first book that was completely dedicated to him, I think, was a biography that you published. That's right, yeah. And then later there was that book about him in Berlin, which I think is a very fascinating chapter of not only uh, Crowley, but, 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 also but history, yeah, German Berlin history. history and German history and esoteric history of the German speaking world. Extremely fascinating. And now, very, very recently, this new book that just came out, um, Alistair Crowley in America, Art, Espionage and Sex Magic in the New World. So before we go to that last volume, why has Crowley been so important for you in, pub in your publication life? Why do you come back to him over and over again? Yeah, well, I suppose partly, partly because... I mean, I had to. I suffered a lot of uh, trouble when I was at Oxford because when the college chaplain found out that I was interested in Crowley, and he thought my soul was imperiled, you know. Yeah. Um, and there were efforts to get me out of the college because you know, it, it was supposed to be I was supposed to be becoming a Christian priest, and Crowley had this reputation of being anti-Christian. Yeah. But it never struck them that most of the uh, philosophical school of Oxford and Cambridge and most of the scientific, large parts of the physics and bio biology uh, schools were also anti-Christian. They just didn't say so. But they were indifferent, you know, indifferent to Christianity. So it was a kind of, why should Crowley be treated unlike any other scientist? Well, there is the point. It's because he, whereas a biologist studies uh, cells and molecules and uh, the workings of bodies. Uh, Crowley's study was, was the nature of uh, spiritual human potential. In other words, he's, he's walking over the church's traditional territory, and uh, therefore he's much more dangerous than a mere scientist. <laughs> Being a, a, His form of atheism is potentially regarded as uh, much more serious. He, he parodied this himself in the 30s. Uh, students were, were going to be sent down. Uh, he kicked out of the university uh, in the 1930s because they'd invited Crowley to give a lecture to a poetry society. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was led by the, by the Roman Catholic chaplain, Ronald Knox, uh, who said that uh, you know, Crowley's reputation was so bad that it would bring the university into disrepute for students to even think about discussing his ideas. Yeah. Now, this seems to me to be such an interesting uh, point in history of the rejection of a magician, uh, the like of which hadn't been seen in Oxford since Giordano Bruno arrived in Oxford in 1583, you know, 350 years or so earlier. Quite amazing. One of my dear tutors had seen Crowley in the streets in in Oxford in 1930, yeah. and was afraid was afraid of him yeah. because he'd been written about as a murderer, a cannibal, a white slave trader, a devotee of Satan. I mean, it doesn't get much worse. <laughs> Even the SS in Germany was was 
frightened in, in a, to a degree of Alistair Crowley. I mean, it's quite extraordinary how, how this man has achieved this amazing reputation. So as I had a nose, and I'd read his Confessions, which was a book that was republished in, in the 70s in England, an interesting version of it edited by Simons and Grant, The Confessions of Alistair Crowley. I'd read that, and I thought it was one of the best things I'd ever read in my life, because I was into things like T. Lawrence, you know, Lawrence Arabia's writing. He was a very fine, very fine writer. And I thought Crowley was some of the best prose I've ever read in my life, and certainly one of the best thinkers on metaphysical subjects. And the image of Crowley was so black, and yet the enlightenment I was getting from the book was so light that I was always aware that I wanted to to get to the truth of it. Mm -hmm. And I didn't get a direct opportunity until uh, around 1990. And um, I was going to do a film on Crowley for Channel 4. And I started researching his actual papers at the Warburg Institute. And the more I read, the more brilliant, more respect I had for him. And I didn't find anything evil or wicked or or what's the word, you know, so like you, as if you were reading the writings of a criminal or mm-hmm. somebody was psychotic or even mad, you know, or dotty or just a bit crazy. These writings were rational. They were sound. They were humorous. They were broad-minded. They, they were not a, a bunch of prejudice. They were well-reasoned. And, they, you know, you, you just felt, I'd love to have met this fellow. You know, I'd have liked to spend time with, with him. Mm-hmm. So there was always, I I always felt, you know, whenever I see an injustice against a figure, especially a a writer or something like that, I do want to do something to help. And at the time, the only people who were into Crowley were dismissed by the mainstream as just New Age nutters, people who you wouldn't really want to know. Freemasonry, of course, had dismissed Crowley and they wouldn't let him join the Grand Lodge of England, even though he'd been initiated into masonry in Paris in 1903. The previous librarian at the Grand Lodge Library in, in London, when I was when I was working with the British Freemasonry movement, he had destroyed all the letters of Crowley to Grand Lodge. I mean, really? yeah, I mean, this is the, how open-minded and wonderfully truth-loving these people are. You know, yeah. you, you threaten them, and suddenly, truth, brotherly love. And charity goes out the window. You know, you're always dealing with, you know, so what, what had Crowley done? What, 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 you know, I, I wanted to know. So I started researching in great depth. And uh, that research went on for a long time. Uh, TV wouldn't, wasn't interested in a truthful presentation on Crowley, and it probably still isn't. Um, it's too useful to have this bogeyman. Mm-hmm. You know, idea sells but, better. Yeah. Well, you can't live for these people because they come and go, and the truth always comes out. And True. eventually, you know, eventually, people who want to know will know. But if if the battle for truth isn't worth fighting, I really don't know why we're talking today. <laughs> Absolutely, no, and uh, is, no. But I'm just saying that you get the impression that the big media who are out there to make big numbers, are yeah, and they're so dim, are they? And all that in the, ah, in the truth. Right. It's incredible. Most most of them would, find, would be hard pressed to pass a difficult examination in philosophy or anything that required real mental agility. Yeah. Most people, most people in me, I worked in television for ten years. It was a desert of uh, that kind of intelligence, which is interesting, full of a lot of what we say in English, smart asses, mm-hmm. clever at personal advancement, and they read those such books as were necessary to help them advance. Yes, but but it is not a world of truth seekers. Truth has nothing to do with it. It's what it's what works. Yes. Now, when you think of an organ like television, which is so profoundly significant a development, nothing like it ever been known. The first people who wanted to get hold of it were the government. Uh, I believe the Nazi Party had the first television service in Berlin, and probably would have liked to have extended it universally. Um, So it's a power thing, television. So as I learned, it serves powers, whoever those powers may be in any particular place. The tragedy, of course, is that the ordinary people now rely on it in the way they rely on a supermarket. 
which yeah. is why book, books are so important because books are still the main the main uh, way of getting free information to people. Absolutely. And I very much like what you said earlier that when you read a book, you kind of get in the state of the mind of the writer at the time when he was writing that book. And I find that uh, I've never heard it said like that, but it speaks very clearly to me. And I think I think that's that's why books actually latest statistics say books are coming back now. So maybe there is some hope about it. Well, you know, people say to me, somebody says to me, I read your book on Kindle. I say, no, you didn't. You read a proof. <laughs> I write books, not pages of writing. Yeah. My aim is to produce or to be to participate in the production of a book. It's like telling me I read the script, but you haven't seen the film. A good book is itself a talismanic object yeah. in which in which the mind of the writer and whatever genius the publisher has to present it are combined by the craftsman in an object which you hold with your hands, touch, and are physically involved with as well as mentally. And speaks uh, to all your five senses through that. It, it does, and if the book is well presented, what a difference that makes. I do judge a book by the cover, I'm afraid. I do. Yeah, uh, that, You know, uh, even if it's a cheaply produced book, I can still judge whether they care about what's in it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, you know, it's, a, it's like the gift of a poor person. It may look poor, but if, if it's got love in it, you, you, you value it. So Crowley was a great writer, I believe. Uh, he's a writer's writer. He's not really a popular writer, although he could write popular magazine articles and did do, and um, he could write a popular novel. He's quite capable of doing that. Yeah. Uh, he's not as well. A certain Alex Churton wrote the novel, which... I find on your web page that's you as well, isn't it? Yes, I'd write novels all the time if I didn't have other things to write. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about books, so I'm holding that book in hand at the moment. So I'm very lucky. Uh, it's not on a Kindle; it's here in my in my hands. Alistair Crowley in America, and that's a very exciting time in in the life. I don't know if it was exciting for him, for Curly himself, but well, I think at it least was. <laughs> probably it I, was. I think but it was. For us who it was painful, now, but it was certainly exciting. Certainly. But for us who research on him or who want to know about him or who are interested in his life and where many of his ideas came from, I think it's an extremely important part of his life. Would you agree? Yes. And... Uh, It should. It, I suppose somebody could have done it before. I, I mean, aspects of the story have obviously been told before, but never systematically mm -hmm. in the, in this way and in and in proper detail. I really wanted to get inside what was going on. He was in America for so long. He had so many connections with America for so much of his life that it really is a separate story. And he uh, influences into America in very strongly after that as well. Yeah. Well, the, the whole section on the legacy shows that. Exactly. And then nowadays, the people who care most possibly, possibly, arguably care most about Crowley are, are, are in America. Mm -hmm. Certainly the OTO, which was founded by an Austrian, wasn't it? Yes. Karl Kellner. Exactly. Uh, the, the industrialist. His, the organization that he, he, he effectively founded, uh, the idea of anyway, He didn't really. He didn't really reach formulation uh, until after his death in 1905. But that now is based in America, so that does say something about the United States. That whatever else you may say, that there are freedom-loving people in America, and there are people with spiritual ideals who are active there. And, and I'm very glad of it. Oh, definitely, and, yeah. And it's nice to know that Crowley has made a contribution there. Yeah, it's been an eye-opener for me as an Englishman to learn about America. Mm. And uh, I wanted to pour that into the book as well. As, um, you, you, America, again, we talk about the media image of America and its history and all the rest of it. Um, there's a lot of bad press in Europe, uh, but a lot of it is ignorant. There isn't anything you can't find in America, you know, good or bad. Yes. Uh, but that leaves a lot of good. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but it was a fascinating to write about America in this period, which I think would be strange to most Americans today as well, and to show what America was like between 1900 and, and the, we take the story up to the modern, to our times today, but the bulk of the story is 
when he was actually physically there, which yeah. is he left in 1919, just as Prohibition came in, yeah. when they, uh, which was very good timing, I think, on his part, <laughs> because he, he would say, you know, if a man cannot get what he will, you know you're in a repressive state. Yeah. When a man cannot obtain what he will. And, of course, America, at that time, the Volstead Act uh, said you, you, whether you will to obtain alcohol or not, you will not be able to get it. And, of course, it created the criminal, the criminal fraternities uh, that America still supports. That's true. But what I was also interested in is a detail, maybe it's the very first part of that book. That's his short time, but still not unimportant time in Mexico. So when you speak about America, it's really the Americas, not just the United States, right? Well, yes. And I did have to think about, shall I have, how much shall I go into the Mexican sojourn? But of course, Mexico in 1900 had a vast uh, American interest in it. There were two American newspapers with the two main English language newspapers of Mexico mm -hmm. were American produced. The Freemasonry in Mexico at that time was dominated by the southern jurisdiction of the ancient and accepted right based mm -hmm. in uh, in. Um, In Charleston. Um, so there was, a, it, and, and of course, the uh, the oil interest in Mexico is bringing Americans in as well. But the leader of Mexico at the time, Porfirio Diaz, tried to keep America at, at a slight distance because he was much more interested in European investment, especially British investment. Interestingly enough, uh, and the Germans were also very interested in getting into uh, Mexico as well. And, of course, it was Germans that were f providing, eventually when Diaz falls and the Mexican Revolution, America, uh, Germans were providing weapons for the rebels, as is well known. As you see in the film The Wild Bunch, if you've ever seen that, very very interesting film yeah, about the... Is, yeah. um, but Mexico in 1900, in 1900, when the Crowley is there, is really another country the, to what we think of it today. Very different kind of world in all sorts of ways. And Crowley was there, uh, as I discovered, uh, as, a, as a really a, a kind of eccentric politician of the legitimist cause. Uh, quite incredible stuff there that has never been any uh, book before. Because he arrives in Mexico under a complete pseudonym, a, a totally invented identity, Isidore Achille O'Rourke. Chevalier Isidore Achille O'Rourke. Uh, very interesting. That raises all kinds of questions about Crowley's early uh, politics and his early interest in espionage. Well, exactly. I was coming to that because you just mentioning that part and uh, somehow that biographical work that it is becomes at some point even a page turner because and not just for the just superficial reasons like espionage or what you just said it's it's fascinating how that man Crowley as he was always got into those incredible situations or put himself into those incredible situations well the story about espionage for the British Secret Services then, etc., which almost led to his demise at some point because it became so dangerous for him. How far were you able to get the information? How far do we know today what really happened? How much is still part of, of something we have to admit we don't know? What? How much of the truth do we know today about that part of his life? Well, now my books are, are considerably more than we knew before. And But I, I discovered a letter in the Warburg Institute, which actually I put in the biography, which makes it absolutely clear that the British Naval Intelligence Department did know um, that Crowley was working in New York to subvert uh, the German propaganda mm -hmm. cabinet, propaganda cabinet, led by the German ambassador von Bernstorff mm -hmm. and Karl Boyed, who was the naval attaché in New York of the German uh, Navy. And Crowley was undermining their, their propaganda work uh, in his own sweet way. How, but it was one of these things, how much of that work was Crowley doing off his own bat and how much might have been suggested by people in London? Mm -hmm. is a very complex issue indeed. 
Uh, but one thing we can say, I think, with perfect certainty today is that Crowley was not, as he was painted afterwards and still is in certain circles, a traitor to his country. This we can be absolutely sure of. There simply isn't a sufficient force in the arguments that he was a, he was a real traitor. He had to appear a traitor. Yes. And it was a very painful business for him in some ways, but he also had the kind of personality, or rather unique personality, which was able to sustain this double life that he was telling the uh, Germans that he'd, he'd, he'd forsaken England and so on. His aim was to make German propaganda ridiculous to the American mind, and he used his psychology to do this. And it was, uh, uh, he, he felt that he was successful in it. But the other thing I was able to get, that because of the freedom of information apparatus in American law, they've released a lot of the early, what was then known as the Bureau of Investigation, later the Federal Bureau of Investigation, FBI. The papers on Crowley are now available to scholars. So uh, I was able for the first time to be able to show the investigation that J. Edgar Hoover w was running into Crowley in 1918, 1919, because the Americans couldn't work out what he was doing. Okay. And, and the British intelligence were not being helpful to anybody in, in, in this matter. And Hoover was convinced to the day Crowley died that somehow Crowley was a dangerous spy, but for whom he could never work out. <laughs> <laughs> That's, well, that's the real art of spying then in that case. <laughs> yes, I think Crowley loved adventure. And I think if you look at his early life as well, he went to St. Petersburg when he was an undergraduate. And he went to St. Petersburg deliberately to acquire experience so that he could join the diplomatic service. He'd been sponsored to go to Cambridge by the British Prime Minister. He aimed to be a diplomat. I think he lost interest in the, the diplomatic service for several reasons. One was he was able to support himself anyway from his, from his inheritance uh, once he was 21. Uh, secondly, I think he realized that all earthly glory is futile. Yeah. That was... He got, had this, you know, the trance of sorrow or he, he realized that, the, you know, he wasn't going to get anywhere by becoming a famous ambassador. He said, who can remember the names of famous ambassadors? <laughs> But I don't think he ever lost his interest in intrigue. And wherever he goes subsequently, as I was able to demonstrate in the biography, he always knows the men at the consul personally and he's going out with them. Now, that's the way a lot of espionage works is simply observation knowing what to inform about and who to inform, and also being available if somebody in those worlds wants you. He, as he said to somebody once who asked about the secret chiefs, you know, the idea that our destiny on the planet is governed by higher entities. Mm -hmm. He said, you may have trouble contacting them, but if they wish to, to contact you, <laughs> you will be assured of their existence. <laughs> and he, he compared the secret chiefs to... The Naval Intelligence Department. Yeah. And uh, it's almost comforting to hear such things, isn't it? Yeah. We'd, we'd, be, we'd like to feel, I think, uh, looked after by higher entities. But I think whether it's the Naval Intelligence Department or the secret chiefs, they, they're still dependent on our weaknesses. I think there are many questions that still come out of Crowley's uh, espionage. But now we can see it for what it was. We can see it clearly. And we can see the process by which he inveigled himself with German propaganda and, and what it achieved for him later and so on. I think we, it would be perfectly right to call Crowley an intelligence asset. The evidence doesn't support the idea that he was an intelligence agent, i.e. he was a paid uh, person. But then again, I don't think Crowley would ever have wanted to have been uh, a minister of the, of the state at all. Yeah. I mean, he wanted to stay free. I mean, he had this strong interest in Irish identity. I think he really believed in a free and independent Ireland. And he was very critical of British government policies right through his life. But being a critic is very different to being a traitor. Uh, Isaiah was a critic of the king of Israel, and, and you know, uh, but that doesn't make him a traitor. He yeah. truly said that the poet's job is to wake his his country up. Yeah. So he was operating as a prophet to his country. But giving him the image of a traitor would much more fit into that search of making him a 
demon or a beast or a cannibal or whatever you said before. It's always it, it, yes, it fits the, that the, image, right? You've got you've got to when you decide to demonize somebody, you yes. you throw everything at them, don't yeah, you? There you are. Um, you throw the lot. So it wouldn't be enough to say that Crowley was anti-Christian. It wouldn't be enough to say he was a magician. It wouldn't be enough to say his relationships with women were difficult. You've got to, you've got to, he's got to actually sell women, treat them as slaves, be a cannibal, mm. murder, murder people, um, be a traitor, and so on and so on. You, you've got to, if you're going to try and blacken. Now, how many people in history have had this kind of image, this treatment on them? It's almost unique in the history of literary yeah. men i can't think of another literary man no that's true and to that extent that's quite amazing you're absolutely and i i strongly believe that either before my time is through or not long after um there will have to be a very general recognition that he was one of the greatest spiritual thinkers of western history yeah. and one of the most original and i i am confident that this day will come if it isn't coming already and but it will be a major shift and it will require a generational change yeah. of perception but your books but are we, certainly helping to well if they if, if, if they bring us closer to the truth then it's yeah. worth worth the misery of writing them <laughs> <laughs> well somebody one of the reviewers wrote that you are talking that book positive for you actually uh, about the formative years of crowley would you See it also like that? Are those US or American years his formative years, or would that be an exaggeration by the reviewer? I think it's an exaggeration. Crowley's philosophy is it develops extraordinarily quickly. If people don't bother to read his essays, he was writing 1902, 1903, 1904, when he was, what, 25, 27, 28, his late 20s, mm. early 30s. He's already developing. He said himself in his autobiography that he felt he was born with a complete mind. Mm -hmm. You know, that he was a complete individual when he was born and that he was almost not fully formed intellectually by any means. He, he had to travel a lot. I mean, he, I think the years in India are formative, 1901, 1902, yes. uh, when he's in Ceylon, or Sri Lanka, as it's called now, and in India. I think those were real, because he wanted to understand Buddhism from the inside. He wanted to understand Hinduism, uh, Brahmin, Brahmin philosophy, from the inside. And he grappled and struggled with it and wrote some incredibly complex uh, essays on those subjects of very high intellectual order. Uh, so I think he's, he, he's thinking on many subjects. And, of course, when this climaxes in 1906, when he achieves samadhi, the obliteration of, mm -hmm. you know, of, of the ego and, and the, the identification of subject and object, what he calls the intimate knowledge of the holy guardian angel. Uh, he realizes, he experiences what he calls the Lord, the Adonai, within or above his being or that yeah. encompasses his being. And from that day on, He's either in the God state or he's the idiot dangling in the world like a puppet in a way. But yeah. he's not a he's not a puppet by any means. Alistair Crowley, the naughty boy, never stops. He was always a naughty boy. He was a naughty boy when he was a boy, and he stayed a naughty boy. And and that was, to my mind, part of his charm and why so one of the reasons why so many women adored him. This is another untruth that he was you know had rotten relations with women. All complete nonsense. He stayed friendly with certain women for many 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 years, and uh, all these relationships went through periods where the woman would be completely crazy about him, and then realize that you couldn't hold this man. <laughs> That's called passion for parts, yeah. <laughs> yes, and, but he gave the same freedom to the women in his yeah, life, you see, sure, that they, yeah. they also were encouraged to, to be true to themselves. So I think he had some marvelous friendships with women. I think he got bored occasionally, you know. But he, unlike many modern writers, he one of his most important books he even ascribed to the lady he was living with at the yes, time. Exactly. You know, I think this is a very feminist thing to do. Truly really feminist, and he, he gives gives all these credit. He's a he's a wonderful. The more you get to know Alistair, the the more amazing you'll you'll an open minded and open hearted person who is not threatened by this level of individual. He's going to have a wonderful time getting to know him. No, I don't think America was formative. It was formative in his magical development. He becomes a magus. 
mm-hmm. with a word. He identifies, he gets to the point, he identifies himself with the word Tholema. In that sense, it's formative. But in terms of his overall intellectual outlook on the world and his spiritual outlook, uh, no, it's part of the, it's part of the, it's part of the test of who he is. I think in America, he was tested. He yes. the God, God's put him through it, right? And they took him to the bottom of his being. They slammed him down in New Orleans in uh, January 1917 with no money, no prospects, nothing. And he has to start again. And it's, it's an incredible story. He goes on strike. He says, I'm not, I've had enough of working for the gods. <laughs> I'm not writing anymore. And you see him deal with that situation in, in New Orleans in 1917 and sit, spending his afternoons sitting in a corner in the old quarter, fighting out his inner battle with himself. And you see how he survives. Quite an inspiring story. Make a wonderful film. Crowley's life is all formative in, in a sense. Everything that happens to him leads him to new insights. Everyone has their favorite Crowley of one period or another. I like American Crowley, although he said afterwards that he was too immature to deal with opportunities that came his way. I think that's a very modest way of putting it. He was not able at that time in his life to make the best of the opportunities. No. Um, but he's, he, he certainly went through the mill, as we say. He went through the experience. And it's a much more complex experience than any other esoteric figure in history, I think. I don't. I think he would give Giordano Bruno a run for his money, or Henry Cornelius Agrippa, well, uh, any of these, or, or uh, Cagliostro, who he thought was a previous incarnation of his. He yes, comes exactly. To realization of his that. He's also, goodness sake, more uh, considerably funnier than any of them. Greater sense of adventure and incredibly more lovable. But um, I try to give you as much of him as is possible to give. I always felt that let his voice be heard. You'll get the idea, unless you're sort of the automatic, small-minded, narrow type for whom meeting a big personality like that is just too much to bear. He did want to liberate uh, mankind. His middle name was Alexander, which Mm -hmm. means helper of men, and he was very proud of that. I mean, the name Alistair is what he thought was the true Gallic form of yes. Alexander. Yeah. But he got it wrong, as he said. But then he, he looked at the spelling and he said, hmm, I like that. And of course, he's the only Alistair that's ever been. Nobody else has been Alistair, A-L-E-I-S-T-E-R. Yeah. You know? so yeah, exactly. It was a major challenge to research it, and but an absolute joy I did get moments of joy in the book where I thought, ah, we're seeing this clearly now. We're, we're, we're seeing it clearly for the first time. Right. And there are many characters who entered his life that you've never read about in any depth at yeah. uh, that time. And uh, his love is the greatest love of his life, really, other than Rose, his first wife. Jean Foster or Jean Foster mm-hmm. that comes over very strongly in the book. So there's, there's, a, there's a great romance. Uh, um, he, he said years later... Did she really break my heart? Well, I think if anyone ever broke Crowley's heart, it was her. And she was quite, she was a theosophist. She was a formidable person indeed, a very formidable individual. So that's a big part of the story, which we've been able to reveal in its, its depth. That was a joy to behold. I really grew to, to like her. Uh, and she lived till 1970. I couldn't believe it. And I thought, my oh, God, really? I, wish I'd, I wish I'd been born 10 years earlier and could have interviewed her. Yeah. I'd love amazing. to. Amazing. Well, Tobias, this is all really fascinating. A, thanks for writing those books and for letting us participate in what uh, fascinating personality Alastair Crowley was. Thank you for sharing it with us today. I can only incite people to go and get that book because it's it's really lovely and get it as a book print it and hold it in hands and read it Tobias before we leave each other let's know about any upcoming projects that you would like maybe to share already with us so that we look forward to something by you coming out soon you know, the original word for chakra, as I understand it, was wheel, uh, the wheels, you know, mm-hmm. the wheels, the chakras, and the Hindu physiognomy. These wheels never stop turning. <laughs> That's the great thing. <laughs> uh, well, I suppose they must come to an end sometime, but so long as they turn, I keep turning. And 
I've got a, uh, my next work after this is meant to be the ultimate book on the 1960s, which I've always wanted to do, and it's called The Spiritual Meaning of the 60s. Wow. Yeah, and I wanted to do the whole thing and really get because I grew up in that period. Big subject. And, yeah, a big, big, big subject. Again, one of those things that bring me your difficult questions. I want, <laughs> as far as I understand, there is no book on this subject anywhere. There are lots of books about the sixties, events. There are political analyses and all the rest of it. But this is the spiritual meaning of the sixties. Mm. That's what I'm looking for. What is the spiritual meaning of the sixties? And obviously for that, you must obviously look at the spiritual content. Yeah. Some people say there was no spiritual content of the 60s. It was an era of superficiality, of mindless rebellion and all the rest of it. Well, I, I look into all that and I go also into industry and uh, commerce and uh, the space race, the development of plastics, the technology, but obviously also uh, the counterculture, uh, music, movies, television developments all around the world. And... Um, also in my own life, and, and I, I regard my own perception of the period as, as valid as anybody else's. Sure. Um, uh, so that's out next year. It's probably an early summer, the spiritual meaning of the 60s. And I'm now uh, just about to start my next book, uh, which will be looking at India. I'm not going to say any more about it than I want to. I want to clarify. <laughs> <laughs> some, <Good. laughs> some of the misapprehensions and complexities about Indian uh, thought and its relevance to the Western esoteric tradition. Yeah, as one of the reviewers, another one says, um, Tobias Churton has a habit of setting himself difficult topics to cover and then making them accessible through good scholarship and sharp, lucid, explanatory style. Well, well said, well, isn't it? <laughs> couldn't put it better. <laughs> <laughs> Tobias Churton, it was lovely to talk to you today. Thank you so much for your time, but especially also for being so open and letting us look deep inside in your laboratory, let's put it that way. And thanks for sharing all this with us. It was great a great pleasure. pleasure. And I hope sometime we'll speak again here on Thought Hermes. Thank you, Rudolf. Thank you. Well, I'm definitely on the lookout for the two upcoming books that Tobias was talking about. Please note that this interview has already been recorded a bit over three months ago and that therefore, when he talks about the release date for his new book saying next summer, he of course means summer of this year, 2018. So watch out and if you are a regular listener to Thoth Hermes, I'm sure you will also hear me mention when the book appears on the shelves. There is still one more thing I would like to announce to you today. Thomas Carlsson, the famous Swedish teacher and occultist, founder of Dragon Rouge and one of the main representatives of the left-hand path, will soon be back on Thoth Hermes with a long-awaited interview as a follow-up on his interview which he did for us in episode number four in season one. So, if you have not yet heard that episode, you should maybe go there and listen to it, so that you will be prepared when Thomas returns. And then you will hear him talk about topics such as the 11th dimension of Benoit Mandelbrot and the 11th Cliffoth, the night side of the runes and the hypercube, the multimedia transmission of esoteric wisdom, the new necromancy and to raise the dead, the global and the local, ICT and IRL worldwide networks, and the Megamind as the vehicle of the dragon's manifestation. Also about new book releases and the forthcoming audiobooks. Huge program and a very exciting one. And this is now the end of today's episode, which was number three in our season two of the Thoth Hermes podcast. Thank you for listening. I hope that once again we were able to give you some fresh ideas 
and new thoughts about our esoteric and occult worlds. Our next episode will present an interview with Dr. Stephen Edred Flowers, centered around his new book, Original Magic, The Rituals and Initiations of the Persian Magi. Last time I had announced an interview with Martin Fox. This interview has been recorded and will be on its way sometime soon as well, but it will become part of a special format. Wendy Rule is back with her night sea journey, and I will now let you go. Thanks for listening, and looking forward to you coming back here. Take care, stay tuned, hear you soon. Fair, slow.